we'll be dealing with uh, chapters 8 to 14 of the uh, prescribed textbook. Chapter 8 essentially deals with interrogation, interception, and the establishment of bodily features. Now, uh, obviously, as you can imagine, as soon as uh, an offense has been committed, um, the police need to investigate. And in their, their investigate, investigation, they may need to interrogate suspects. Uh, they, may, they may need to intercept uh, communication. Uh, and they may need to establish uh, bodily features uh, to make sure that the person that they have or the person that they've arrested is actually linked to the commission of said offense. Now, in pursuing uh, their mandate, the police are mandated in terms of section 205 of the constitution um, to conduct investigations into crime. So uh, other than uh, uh, legislation in terms of the Criminal Procedure Act and other ancillary legislation which grants powers to the police to investigate. Our constitution, which is the supreme law of the land, also uh, empowers members of the South African police services to conduct investigations into crime. Um, by like token, uh, when the police uh, conduct their investigations, uh, particularly as far as uh, trying to interrogate people who might uh, know something about uh, or have details pertaining to the commission of a particular offense. Section 35, subsection 1, subsection A of the Constitution says that every person, every citizen, uh, confronted by members of the South African Police Services has the right to remain silent, but they do not have the right not to be questioned. The police can, for example, uh, uh, pick you up on the street and say, look, we need to ask you questions about one, two, three. Uh, and they can take you into uh, their charge office. Uh, but as soon as you get there, uh, you can simply say, look, I'm not prepared to say anything. The police can simply ask, ask away, uh, do you know A? Have you had any relationship with A at any point? Uh, were you with him on a particular day? And you can simply say, I, I reserve my right to uh, remain silent. The police, as I indicated, are not precluded by any law from interrogating any witness in the investigation of crime. Um, in the same vein, uh, citizens are not uh, legally bound to furnish police with information about the commission of a crime, except uh, uh, in two notable instances. Uh, the com in terms of our common law, uh, or, or high treason, let, let, let me put it this way, high treason um, is one of uh, uh, our most uh, notable uh, laws at the common law, those of you who have already studied uh, criminal law. And there are certain instances uh, where, uh, where, where, where legislation provides uh, and compels uh, for witnesses to furnish uh, information about uh, the commission of a particular crime. Now, um, ladies and gentlemen, in the past, uh, questions have been asked in our exam. I think it was in, uh, in our uh, June, sorry, May, June uh, 2022 exam. As I indicated to you in our previous uh, session, um, our exam is tailored in such a way that we ask you um, 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 our model answers are tailored in the in the in the fashion of uh, of uh, scenarios. We'll give you a scenario, for example, and say A uh, finds himself in a particular situation where an offense has been committed. Um, uh, do you really think, looking at the circumstances, that A had the right or A was com compelled? 
under South African law, whether under common law or under any statute that you might be aware of, to tell the police about the commission of a particular uh, offence. Now, moving further, um, the police may also enter a premises to conduct investigations. Um, the slides there only refer to the fact that uh, this is what I've referred to earlier. Every person has the right to privacy and the right to dignity. Uh, every person has the right uh, to security and control over their body, not to be subjected to any medical or scientific experiments without their informed consent. Now, when you look at the slide that I've just put on there, I, 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 I apologize, ladies and gentlemen. I think my, my, my discussion uh, somehow went ahead of uh, some aspects which I should have alluded to you as well. Now, when you look at interrogation, uh, interception, and the establishing of bodily features, if you look at the constitutional provisions that you have on your screen, you will realize that uh, they are cover, they cover uh, all the aspects which are uh, alluded to in chapter eight. Section 10 of the constitution says that every person has, has, has the right to have their dignity respected and protected, which entails that if you are going to be um, 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 if bodily features are going to be uh, determined by the police, if the police are going to arrest you and they are going to seek to establish um, or, or to take fingerprints from you or to take buccal samples from you, uh, your bodily integrity is to an extent being violated. Um, um, uh, that is now in terms of section 10. If you look at section 12, subsection to subsection one, subsection C. Every person has the right not to be subjected to medical or scientific experiments without their informed consent. That is when the, uh, uh, the police have arrested you and they take you to a district surgeon who takes your buccal samples, um, saliva samples, blood samples, and so on and so forth. Now, the only question to be answered once the police uh, have arrested you and they've taken you uh, into their custody and they take you to a district surgeon is whether uh, in doing so, in violating uh, your, 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 your right to dignity uh, by searching you, uh, in violating your dignity uh, by subjecting you to medical or scientific experiments, uh, in this instance, it's not even a medical or scientific experiment, but it is covered uh, under instances where the police would want or would uh, um, facilitate uh, medical uh, procedures that assist them in conducting investigations. Now, here Section 36 would come into play. Uh, if you go to court, for example, and you say, look, I believe that by, by arresting me, by taking these buccal samples, uh, the police were, uh, had actually violated my uh, right to personal dignity, uh, my right not to be subjected to medical or scientific experiments. And the court would look at the circumstances and say, uh, from where we sit, for example, uh, these rights have been violated. But in terms of Section 36 of the Constitution, the limitation clause, uh, can we say in the circumstances that the violation uh, was consonant to the values of the Constitution? Section 12, subsection 2, subsection 1, subsection B, uh, says that every person has the right to security and control over their body. Now, the mere fact that you are arrested, the police accost you off the street, or they come into your house, 
and they uh, decide that you, they have to take you to a police station where they need to establish certain facts, uh, essentially entails that your security and control over your body uh, is somehow violated. The fact that you are taken from the street without necessarily consenting thereto means that these rights are violated. Section 36 will again come into play. Uh, the aspects which are now on your screen, on the slide there, have already been alluded to. There is no duty to provide information to the police during an interrogation. Uh, Section 205 of the Constitution gives the police the right to conduct investigations. Uh, Section 189, uh, this is where the police uh, have arrested you. Now, in terms of Section 205, 205 now of the Criminal Procedure Act, the police have arrested you because they feel that you can provide information pertaining to the commission of a particular crime. And you are saying, I'm not going to say anything to you. Uh, section 189 kicks in. We will deal with Section 189 at a much later date. In terms of Section 26 of the Criminal Procedure Act, the police may enter into a premises to conduct investigations. Now, consent for entry must be sought and obtained from the local, local occupier of the premises. And to this extent, I'm going to quote the case of uh, state versus Butelezi. No, it's not actually state versus Butelezi. It's Butelezi versus the Minister of Safety and Security. It's a 2020 case, volume two, SACR, uh, page 21, GJ. Now, if you read section 26 carefully, it says where a police official in the investigation of an offense or alleged offense reasonably suspects that a person who may furnish information with reference to any such offenses on the premises, such police official may, without a warrant, enter such premises for the purpose of interrogating such person and obtaining a statement from him. However, Permission must be obtained from uh, the occupier of the premises. Now, in Butelezi versus Minister of Safety and Security, uh, the case to which I alluded to earlier, the court went on to say consent must be given freely and voluntarily. The search must not exceed the bounds of consent given. Now, what happened in Butelezi Minister versus Minister of Safety and Security is the following. Um, a child got lost. Um, a child got lost in, uh, I, I, I forget the name of the township, but the child got lost. Uh, lost in the sense that uh, the child, I think, was about 16 years old, um, uh, went gallivanting somewhere. Now, um, what happened was the parents of the child and members of the community had suspicions uh, because the child had previously been seen in this particular tavern that the child might necessarily be in this tavern. So what happened was uh, they went to the police station, uh, uh, informed the police that we suspect uh, that the child might be in Mr. Butelezi's uh, house, the owner of the tavern. Now, with the police, members of the community went to the tavern. What happened at, uh, uh, at the premises of, of Mr. Butelezi uh, was very interesting because uh, firstly, the police uh, intimated to him that, you know, we. Uh, we don't have a search warrant, we don't have anything, but we need to search your house uh, to see whether there is uh, uh, this child that we're looking for. Uh, Mr. Butelezi was about to refuse, but then the police said to him, 
if you look at this crowd, the crowd is very angry. So, 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 um, rather allow us to conduct the search because they might turn ugly and they might assault you or they might do something bad. Now, if you look at it very closely, Mr. Butelezi did not give uh, his consent. Ultimately, he allowed them to search the house and no child was found inside the house. Uh, but the court found that the consent, because the police were arguing, no, he gave us consent. We went there and we told him, look, we want to search the house. Uh, he did give consent, but it was under duress because they were saying to him, um, it's either you allow us or these people might man manhandle you, they might break your house and so on and so forth. The search must not exceed the bounds of consent given. Um, if I recall correctly, uh, as far as the facts in Butelezi versus Minister of Safety and Security are concerned, um, the police also went on to find certain items inside the house, uh, which were not or did not actually form part of the search. Uh, I think it was alcohol. Uh, and they now wanted to question whether he had a license and so on and so forth. But that had not been part of the transaction that Mr. Butelezi uh, had agreed upon initially. Now, in terms of Section 27, of the Criminal Procedure Act, a police official may use force to break into a premises, to break a door or window of a premises uh, in order to gain entry onto such premises. However, there is a proviso. The police official must first audibly demand admission to the premises and notify uh, the occupiers, the purpose for which uh, they seek entry onto the premises. However, there are instances in which a police official may enter premises without necessarily warning uh, uh, the occupiers of the premises. That is, if he believes on reasonable grounds that an article uh, is on the scene or an article is, or is, is in the premises, uh, which if he does not use this uh, uh, force uh, to enter the premises, might be destroyed or disposed of. Section 27 is sometimes called um, the no-knock clause. The ascertainment of bodily features. Now, when we talk about the ascertainment of bodily features, we are talking here about footprints, for example. Uh, you've always heard it spoken of fingerprints, which is the normal way of uh, uh, um, um, identifying uh, every other individual. When you go to, uh, to take your ID, your passport, your fingerprints are taken and they are put on a database. Uh, finger, fingerprints are not, sorry, footprints are not taken. Uh, however, you might ask why footprints? Why would the, the police need to determine footprints? Not even footprints only, even shoe prints. If you remember, if you're old enough to remember or might have read up on the OJ Simpson case back in the late, 80s. At some point, there was a, there was an argument in court pertaining to the type of the 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 the, the type of shoes uh, that uh, OJ wore. Uh, allegedly, or let me not say that OJ wore that the, the the shoe that the assailant uh, 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 was wearing when the the wife of uh, um, or the ex-wife of O.J. Simpson and her boyfriend were killed. Now, eventually, they even had to call in an expert from a an Italian shoemaker. I think it was a Bruno Mali shoe uh, to to determine whether the shoe print that was found inside the yard uh, had in, was indeed a Bruno Mali shoe. And this they wanted to use 
uh, and to compare with a pair of shoes, uh, Bruno Mali shoes, that uh, uh, um, um, uh, O.J. Simpson uh, apparently owned. Uh, so this is where shoe pre prints uh, usually come in. Buccal samples. Buccal samples, as I indicated uh, earlier, that, that is the instance where the, uh, the police need blood samples from you, hair samples, saliva samples. As you will see later, the police do not have the power to take uh, these samples from you. This is governed by Section 37 of the Criminal Procedure Act. Uh, in terms of Section 37, Subsection 1, Subsection C, a police officer may ascertain a mark, characteristic, or other distinguishing feature. Say somebody says that the assailant uh, had a tattoo. Uh, I see a lot of people walking around with, uh, with tattoos these days. Now, uh, the police can obviously, let's say, for example, your, ta your tattoo is, hit, is, is hidden on a... On a on a, on a, uh, uh, I'm, I'm looking for the correct way to use. It's not a private part. Let, 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 let um, um, oh, English. Uh, <laughs> on an intimate part. That's, 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 that's the term that I was looking for. Um, uh, it's hidden on your buttock. It's hidden, you know, somewhere. Uh, at a place where which is not which is not very visible to the naked eye, unless of course you take off your clothes, uh, the police can take you in and they can um, uh, ask you to take your clothes off, take mark shots of the of 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 uh, uh, um, uh, such a feature that is referred to a mark, uh, or you may you may even have a birthmark, a very peculiar birthmark that the police. Uh, need to determine, which is um, somewhere very intimate. They can take you in uh, and do that. However, a police officer has no power to extract blood. Obviously, uh, they are not qualified to, to do that. As I indicated earlier, that would be the job of a, a medical practitioner, a district surgeon, registered nurse uh, to do that. I think we've had a question to this effect in the exam before. So when you read through chapter eight, remember here we are talking about chapter eight deals with uh, interrogation. We've already referred to interrogation. Uh, um, uh, it also deals with the ascertainment of bodily features, and it also deals with uh, uh, interception and monitoring. Now we are dealing here with the ascertainment of bodily features. You must be able to answer questions in the examination pertaining to um, the ascertainment of bodily features, uh, the taking of buccal samples and so on. Who has the power to do it? Uh, what powers do the police have and so on and so forth? Uh, you will notice in your textbook, uh, it is dealt with at length on page, um, yeah, it's from page 185 to page uh, 186. Um, and just as a point of correction, you will notice that uh, on page 186, uh, the content there refers to two cases that served before our courts. Uh, the one is Minister of Safety and Security versus Gaka. And the other is Minister of Security of Safety and Security versus Kaba. Now, Gaga is cited as a as a constitutional court case. It is not. It is not. Uh, I I believe it's an Eastern Cape uh, case because I think the next question that you might be asking me would be why would there be a difference? Because because you'll notice that the content there says that. Uh, the court in each case had a different approach to the interpretation of section 37. Now, uh, now your next question would be, but why would there be a different interpretation where, when there is a constitutional court judgment? So that GACA is not a constitutional uh, court judgment, just to set the record straight. Now, the authority as far as uh, uh, the constitutional constitutionality of the taking of fingerprints is concerned, 
uh, is in State versus Huma. State versus Huma is discussed in your textbook uh, on page 186 to 187. We also had this question in a previous exam paper that was in May, June 2022. We gave you a set of facts. This person doesn't want their fingerprints taken. Now, I'm not going to delve deep into the circumstances uh, under which, uh, or, or, or the, 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 the reasoning of the court uh, on why fingerprints uh, or the taking of fingerprints is constitutional. The information is contained on pages 186 to 187 of your textbook. Uh, study it, know it, and you must be able to uh, answer the questions there too. Uh, in the examination. Suffice it to point out, the court decided in State versus Huma that the taking of fingerprints uh, is not unconstitutional. Any questions before I proceed on to the next chapter? Uh, Mr. Kumwenda, are you seeing any questions uh, on the other side? One minute, I just want to check all the participants. Currently, I don't see anything. Let me just see people. Yes. I, I don't see any question. I don't see any hand. Okay. Now, uh, yeah. ladies and gentlemen, chapter nine essentially deals with uh, search and seizure. Um, I didn't say anything about interception and monitoring. Mm, I beg your pardon uh, on that one. Interception and monitoring. I'm going to mention this passing and in general terms. The police in conducting their investigations have the powers to intercept uh, uh, telephone calls, for example, uh, and to monitor after intercepting your, 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 your telephone calls. But uh, they can only do that after obtaining a permission from a judge. Uh, a police officer cannot simply go in and, uh, and intercept uh, and monitor your conversations. Now, the fact that it happens does not necessarily mean that it's legal. Uh, and I think you have had in the, past, uh, in the past few years in the news, there have been instances of people who are complaining that their communications uh, are intercepted and they are being monitored without uh, this being taken through to a judge. Search and seizure, search and seizure. Now, uh, essentially when conducting investigations, uh, the police might need to search and to take certain items from individuals that are connected to the commission of a crime. Now, it takes us back uh, to the aspects to which I referred earlier. Uh, whenever you go through a chapter uh, of, uh, of the textbook, the prescribed textbook, you will notice that uh, in every chapter, there is a little box just after the index, uh, which uh, contains aspects of the constitution uh, that are dealt with uh, in the particular chapter. You will notice that section 12 is still there, uh, the right to freedom and security of the person. Section 14, the right to privacy uh, is also there. Now, the right to privacy, every person has the right to privacy. Um, the right to privacy, means that in some instances, the police may uh, require to search you. Now, when they conduct a personal search on you, whether they check your pockets, uh, whether they frisk you, uh, that in itself violates a particular section of the constitution. The police may also uh, search your property. Now, the provisions to which I refer, uh, section 12, Section 14, um, the right to privacy, the right to freedom and, and, and security. Uh, also, 
entail that the police may search your property as well. Now, chapter nine of the handbook essentially deals with uh, search of property. We are going to deal very briefly uh, with uh, search and seizure. It means your property is searched and certain items are seized or taken from that property. Now, which items may be uh, uh, seized? You will notice on page, um, yeah, on page 192 of your handbook, section 20 uh, lists the items that may be seized uh, during a search. And what are those? The first one uh, uh, relates to items or articles that are consent in or on reasonable grounds believed to be concerned in the commission or suspected commission of an offense. The, no, the most notable example in this regard, uh, three people go and commit a robbery. Uh, they, let's, let, let's call them A, B, and C, and they use the car belonging to B. Uh, now, upon their arrest, uh, they are using this car as a getaway car. The police, uh, arrest them, and they realize that this car was the one that was actually used uh, in furtherance of the commission of the offense. Um, such an article may be seized. An article which may provide evidence of the commission or suspected commission of an offense. Uh, this is where, for example, in the same robbery to which I referred to, um, A, B, and C, Oh, uh, there is D also. D was not actually, was not actually, actually, if you underline actually, was not actually or practically involved in the commission of the of the robbery, but somehow uh, um, uh, was part of it in that he was a lookout. Uh, and uh, he was doing so losing, using his cell phone. The police may, when conducting their investigations, take that item, the cell phone, uh, um, uh, uh, to look into the communications that are contained therein, in establishing or in conducting investigations, uh, into establishing uh, uh, um, uh, either maybe the, the, the extent to which D was involved in the commission of the offense, or to establish some other aspect pertaining to the investigation um, that may lead to the conviction of A, B, C, maybe even D. An item that is intended to be used or on reasonable grounds believed to be intended to be used for the commission of, a, of an offense. Um, um, here, I'm thinking of what? Let's say a firearm. Uh, uh, a, B, and C were involved in this robbery. Uh, they did not fire a shot, but the police arrested uh, them in possession of a firearm. Let's say it's C's firearm. C's firearm is a licensed firearm. Let's say he was foolish enough to uh, engage in a robbery using his own firearm. The police may seize such an item. Now, there are exceptions to this rule. Not every item can be seized. Privileged documents. Let's say um, 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 in the case of A, B, C, and D, um, uh, D uh, realizes that, you know, um, I, 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 I was, um, uh, there were letters, well, we, we don't use letters anymore these days, <laughs> but let's say he was exchanging letters with uh, A, B, or C about the commission of the offense, and he realizes that the letters are incriminating now, uh, and he knows that the police are coming to him, and he, uh, he decides to engage the services of an attorney. Now, he discusses this with, uh, with the attorney. 
Uh, and he shows that in the letters and he says, yeah, but you, you see, this is actually not incriminating. I, I was just communicating with, uh, with B, for example, not knowing that he was going to commit an offense for argument's sake. Um, uh, but now uh, this is the communication between him and the attorney. Such communication cannot be used uh, uh, or uh, cannot be taken from, from them to be used. Uh, as part of the investigation. However, the holder of the privilege is always the client, but the privilege does not belong to the attorney or the advocate or the legal representative. It always belongs to the client. The client must not have abandoned uh, the privilege. Now, if the police officer, for example, the attorney, for example, decides uh, out of his uh, own good conscience to give this information to the police without the say-so of D, then he's breaking the law. Unless, unless the client D told him, I man, uh, let's rather take this to the police and let's see what they make of it. And only the client can relinquish this privilege. Um, I'm going to ask you to also go into uh, search warrants. Ne? Remember, a search can be conducted with or without a warrant. Ne? A search can be conducted with or without a warrant. Now, a, a warrant that is conducted in terms of a search, um, in terms of such a warrant, the general rule that applies is that the search must preferably be issued. No, 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 no. I'm lying to you, ladies and gentlemen. Not preferably. It must be issued by a judicial officer. Um, uh, um, uh, and it must also uh, uh, subscribe to certain uh, rules. It must be very specific. It must be very clear. Uh, uh, for example, um, before the judicial officer can issue such a warrant, uh, the judicial officer must, on reasonable grounds, believe that the article that is sought to be searched uh, is on the said premises. Uh, it is an article that is referred to in Section 20. Section 20 is the one that we referred to earlier. It must be one of these articles. Ne? The action of the police of the or of the of the authorities or the people seeking the warrant must be reasonable. Now we refer we we, we go back to uh, that term uh, to which we've referred so many times. Reasonable. Ladies and gentlemen, the information to which I referred uh, is contained in section uh, 21 of the Criminal Procedure Act, uh, search warrants issued by a magistrate or justice of the peace. Uh, there must be reasonable grounds. I remember we dealt with the reasonable grounds in chapter six um, and so on and so forth. Now, I'm going to ask you to read through, not read through, study through uh, search warrants and searches without search warrants. I'm trying to save us time. Uh, remember, a search can be conducted with or without a search. Now, where there is no search warrant, uh, this is where uh, a police officer believes on reasonable grounds uh, that a search warrant will be issued if applied for. A delay in obtaining such a warrant would defeat the object of the search. Now, this is where a police officer, for example, got wind from deep throat that um, uh, uh, on, 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 on a particular premises, drugs are being stored and sold. Now, he realizes that if he now goes and looks uh, for a warrant, 
somehow you see things like drugs. Drugs, I'm talking here about uh, the ordinary ones that we are aware of. Uh, most of them are constituted of pills, powder, some come in liquid form. Uh, these are easily disposable. Now, a police officer might realize if I'm now going to wait for a warrant, uh, uh, these are easily disposable. It might well be that when, that when we get to the scene, the items have already been disposed of. Section 25.3 uh, deals with the same. Section 25.3 essentially relates to instances where the police are saying to the magistrate, the one who issues the warrant, this is a very serious offense that involves national security. Now, we went into that premises without a warrant uh, and conducted the search because we were afraid that if we, if we wait, uh, we were looking for documents, documents that uh, pertain to high treason, for example. Uh, and if we were going to wait, uh, um, uh, the documents would easily have been uh, removed or the documents would easily have been disposed of. Now, in all this, remember I referred to section 12 of the constitution, uh, the right to freedom and security of the person. Section 14, the right to privacy. Uh, there is also section 35.5, the exclusionary rule. What does the exclusionary rule say? Now, in terms of the exclusionary rule, evidence that is obtained in violation of the constitution, I'm now paraphrasing, in violation of the constitution must be excluded. Section 35.5 does not say it should be uh, excluded. It does not say it can be excluded. It says that if the police officer, if, if police officers go into the premises and they violate every rule book uh, in seizing an item, in searching and seizing an item, such evidence must be excluded. But obviously, obviously, if we are in, involved in a court case. Uh, it must pass constitutional master. Our jurisprudence is replete with cases uh, of, of, of searches and seizures which were taken to, the, to, 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 uh, to our courts. Uh, Section 36 applied where the court felt in spite of all this, in spite of all this, uh, we feel that uh, um, um, uh, the interest of justice dictate that the evidence should go in. But I should warn you, courts are usually more inclined to lean in favor of uh, not accepting evidence that violates um, 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 uh, the rule of law uh, or legislation or the constitution. Any questions before I proceed to chap chapter 10? I seem to be having a monologue. Are you there, ladies and gentlemen? Are you hearing me? Yes, sir. Oh, no, I see I see a, a, a hand there. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, I'm going to now move over to chapter 10. Chapter 10 essentially deals with uh, uh, bail and other forms of release. Now, as soon as uh, an accused is arrested, arraigned, um, a particular right of the accused is violated. Can any of you tell me which, which one that is? No, 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 no. Uh, let, let's not even go to the arraignment. As soon as the accused is arrested, which right is violated? Anyone? 
Section 12. Mm -hmm. Kenebu Fili says that the right to remain silent. Do you agree? Do you agree? Uh, freedom of movement. As soon as the accused is arrested, which, which right uh, at the first point of asking, which right is violated? Any takers? The ra uh, um, Ambani, you wanted to say something. Uh, I was say, I was say, I was thinking freedom of movement. Yeah, the right to free, to, to the, the the right to freedom. Uh, and the right, your right to to to, to freedom, is violated. Remember, as soon as you are arrested, you cannot move around. You are now in the custody of uh, members of the South African Police Services. So your right to freedom of movement is essentially violated. Now, bail. Bail is a mechanism that is used uh, to mediate uh, uh, the violation of the right to um freedom which is violated as soon as uh, uh, a person is uh, is arrested now there are a few constitutional considerations that we need to consider uh, when dealing with the freedom of the individual as it pertains to bail section 35 subsection 1 subsection f speaks to uh, the interests of justice. Uh, Dr. Mkwena. Yeah. I see there's a jo junior Lebukhile, or it's a, or it's a histor historical hand, I don't know. Junior Lebukhile. Uh, ask away, ask away. It's a, it's a historical hand, we may proceed. I don't think it's a historical hand because I've, uh, the, 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 uh, I've, I've never. Who is it, Ndate uh, Kumenda? Johnny Arlebukhile. Oh, Kilebukhile, can you just put your hand down, please? Now, in terms of section 35, subsection 1, subsection F, uh, An accused must be released from custody if the interests of justice permit. In terms of section 35, subsection 3, subsection H, sub this provision guarantees the presumption of innocence. We dealt with this in chapter one. Every person has the right to, uh, to be presumed innocent until found guilty by a competent court. Uh, section 12, 1A, we've already dealt with this one. Freedom and security of the person. Now, whenever you talk about bail, you must remember all these. Every person who is, who is arrested has the right to be released if the interest of justice permit. In the same vein, a person who is arrested is presumed innocent until proven guilty. Um, and you, 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 you'll be surprised, ladies and gentlemen, how, how many uh, people do not believe in this right. Um, um, and I'm, I'm saying this at the risk of being lynched by somebody somewhere, <laughs> because uh, if you listen, for example, to the news, um, um, let's give uh, the example of... Uh, Tabo Bester, the most notable one. Tabo Bester was arrested a few days ago. Now, Tabo Bester is also due to all these rights, in spite of, him, of what you might feel about it or what he has done. He's also due to, to all these rights. Um, meaning that because we have courts of law, we have the rule of law, he still has to go through uh, the courts. The court has to determine, not you and I, we cannot be sitting there in our armchairs and saying, yeah, man, he did this, that, and the other, so he should not be released. No, um, he's still 
uh, enjoys the presumption of innocence. What if, let me just give you an example. What if Tabo Bester now comes and says, hey man, I was suffering under uh, somnambulism. You know, I was sleepwalking. I did not know what was happening. Somebody took me out of prison. I didn't know. And then I found myself in Tanzania or wherever he was arrested. You know, maybe he might have such a story. The court must have the benefit of that story. The Constitution al always takes precedence. There are two types of bail, ladies and gentlemen. Um, bail that takes place before the first appearance in court. What is the first appearance? I ask. The first appearance is before the accused even bef uh, uh, appears before a judge or a magistrate. The accused has just been arrested. The 48-hour rule, remember we spoke about the 48-hour rule in chapter 7. We spoke of the 48-hour of, of the rule. The 48-hour rule has passed. Uh, the, the investigating officer is taking the accused to court. Uh, within that period, within the 48-hour period, be, be, between then and uh, 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 him being brought to court. This is where this bail takes place that I'm referring to. The magistrate and the judge have not come in. Bail in the court of court proceedings. So we have two types. Before first appearance, uh, during the court, I, I didn't want to say after the, the first appearance, because as soon as the accused appears uh, before a court, that is the first appearance. So if we start saying after the, the court appearance, it don't essentially make sense. Bail in terms of section 59. Now we've had this in our exam, ladies and gentlemen, where we gave a scenario. I think it was, if it, it's, if it was not in October, November, then it was in May, June last year. Uh, but it's not to be repeated, uh, as I've already indicated to you. We never repeat our questions. So um, you might use this for the benefit of understanding uh, the format that we use in setting our exams. Bail before the first appearance in court. This is police bail in terms of section 59, which is granted by the police. Now, it is important for you to understand uh, the procedure and uh, the limitations pertaining to police bail, because usually that's how we would ask our questions. It is granted in terms of less serious offenses. Now. Uh, the legislature, in terms of Section 59, says that uh, uh, bail may be granted uh, by a police officer, except in, in the instance of offenses that are referred to in Part 2 or Part 3 uh, of Schedule 2. Uh, of the Criminal Procedure Act. Now, here I, I simply said less serious offenses. But when you come to the exam, you may say, you may put it as it is in the textbook, but if you say it was in the instance of less serious offenses, I'm still going to give you a mark. Now, it must be granted by a commissioned officer. Not every uh, Tom, Dick, and Harry in a police station can grant uh, 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 bail before the first appearance. Ne? Um, as I indicated before the first appearance, um, it must be granted in a reasonable amount. Bail in respect of police bail cannot be granted in respect of infrastructure related crimes. Now, the most notable uh, uh, infrastructure-related crime that I'm aware of, if somebody uh, damages, uh, like we had in the past few weeks, the past few months, damages uh, uh, as, uh, 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 um, infrastructure belonging to ESCOM, uh, uh, such a person cannot be granted bail by a police officer. Prosecutorial bail, in terms of Section 59, uh, subsection capital A. It is granted in terms of Schedule 7 offenses. 
it is granted before the first appearance. Like, if, uh, as I indicated earlier, this is the instance where the accused has not appeared before court. Now, how, how does this work in practice? Um, 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 uh, Mr. Mr. Kumwenda can 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 perhaps uh, uh, direct me as soon as I've made the point. Um, uh, um, uh, he's a former prosecutor. He'll know. Uh, usually, what happens here is that the prosecutor grants bail. What happens is prosecute uh, during a weekend, for example, accused is arrested over a weekend, having committed allegedly a Schedule Seven offence. Our courts are not operational on weekends. Uh, you may find, for example, that in in the in the high court, uh, there are sessions that are there. I think they they refer to them as uh, um, I forget the term. But in our in our ordinary magistrates court, you do not find magistrates sitting over a weekend. So accused has been arrested for committing a Schedule Seven offence. Uh, now he wants to be released on bail. Uh, what happens is that uh, uh, my colleague, the prosecutor, Mr. Kumwenda, will be called. Um, uh, usually, they'll, uh, the, 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 the police will have his number, attorneys will have his number, and then they'll call him from his home. Uh, there is a certain form that he fills in, if he feels after reading the docket, uh, that this person is eligible for bail. And then he'll also set the, the date of appearance on the form. For the accused to appear, Mr. Kumwenda, is the process still applicable? Uh, Section hey. 59A. Yes, Doctor. Yes, Doctor. Doctor Mukwena. But know what happens? Even if it's a Schedule Seven offences, whereby you can be released by police bail. But once we have a, if you have a previous convic conviction or a pending warrant, then. You will, you will not qualify, and it, it changes. It becomes a Schedule 5 bail application. Only the you, might, you have to appear before the court. Ah. Whereby, whereby you have to show the court that it is in the interest ah. of justice that you should be released out on bail. Thank you very much. Thank you very no, much, thank Advocate you, Kumwenda. You see, Advocate, Advocate Kumwenda is still, is still uh, uh, fresh. He, he knows it very well. This is how we do the appear, uh, apply in... Just in case you were wondering why, what, what, why, why would a, how would a prosecutor grant bail? Now I see in your textbook it's a, a bit complicated uh, how it is explained, uh, but that is that is quite simply how it works in operation. But you can go through uh, uh, the information in your textbook. It's also very helpful, I might say. But the most common type of bail that we are aware of is court bail. Fact has to be taken into account. Now, this is on page uh, section 60, ah, page 218. Now, these are dealt with on a daily basis. Uh, in a year or two or three, some of you will be attorneys, some of you will be advocates and so on. Section 60, subsection 4, when you go to court and you have received a brief about a client who is in custody and you want to apply for bail, section 60, subsection 4, that is what you will need to know. That is what you will need to master, including the case law pertaining to it. Now, uh, you will notice on page um, uh, 218, uh, paragraph 5.2, uh, section 60, subsection 4 provides that the refusal of bail uh, and the detention of an accused in custody shall be in the interest of justice, where one or more of the following grounds are established. Remember, as I indicated, uh, um, uh, in terms of Section 35 1F of the Constitution, an accused person must be released if the interests of justice warrant such a release. Now, the interests of justice, according to Section 60, subsection 4 of the Criminal Procedure Act, says that the interests of justice 
uh, say that the accused can be released on bail under the following circumstances, where there is a likelihood where there is a likelihood that the accused, if released, will endanger the safety of the public or will commit a Schedule One offence. According to my notes there, uh, if he will endanger the safety of the public uh, or any uh, particular person, or he, uh, uh, or he will endanger a particular person. As far as committing a Schedule One offense, I'm not sure how, how the state or how the accused would be expected to prove that he's not going to commit a Schedule One offense, but that's what the law says. Where there is a likelihood that the accused, if released on bail, will attempt to evade trial. Ne? Where there is a likelihood that the accused, if released on bail, will attempt to influence or in, in, intimidate witnesses or conceal or destroy evidence. That is this one. Where there is a likelihood that the accused, if released on bail, will undermine or jeopardize the objectives or the proper functioning of the criminal justice system. Now, that is a very generic one. Uh, but I'll come to that point later. The last one, where there is, where in exceptional, where in exceptional circumstances, you see subsection four, subsection four e is a bit different from the rest because it says where in exceptional circumstances, it mentions exceptional circumstances, there is a likelihood that the release of the accused will disturb public order, um, public peace or security. Now, if you look in your textbook, uh, and we will have a question in the exam, we will have a question in the exam on these aspects to which I refer now. Now, if you look at section 64, subsection A, where there is a likelihood that the accused if released on bail will endanger the safety of the public or any particular person or will commit a Schedule 1 offence. Now, the legislature has, went, has gone at length, and this was apparently meant to be, serve as uh, a list of guidelines to magistrates uh, so that, you know, because in the past, uh, these provisions were there, but magistrates sometimes used their own discretion uh, in determining the aspects to be determined uh, when denying bail. Now, if you look at A and you look on page 219, paragraph 5.2.1, the ground in section 64A, factors which the court may consider, 65. Now, if you go to the Criminal Procedure Act itself, it lists these aspects. So in considering whether there is a likelihood that the accused if released on bail will endanger the safety of the public and so on, the factors that the court must look at are contained in section 60, subsection 5, and they are listed there. And the list goes on. When you go to B, B is listed in section 60, subsection 6, and so on and so forth. Now, uh, you are going to, to have a question in the exam. Uh, I'm, going, I'm not going to, to, to tell you now which of these aspects we will be referring to. But you must be able to match, if we give you a set of facts, you must be able to match the aspects in section 60, subsection 4, with the aspects that are referred to in section 65 to 68. Yeah, no, 69, not 8. 60, subsection 9. I leave that up to you. If you still do not understand what I meant, if you still do not understand the content, you can always come back to me later. In granting bail, 
conditions are often fixed by the court. The condition, for example, that the accused should report to the police station. The condition, for example, that the accused should desist from uh, uh, visiting a particular area. Say, for example, um, um, in the case of reporting, the police, uh, the, the, the court may, for example, set a condition that the accused must report to the police station. There is a register that they usually sign uh, at the police station that he's still there. He's not, he's not com committing crimes or anything. The police might agree with him that he might, he might, he might, or not, not the police agreeing with him. The court will say, for example, every Friday, you must report to the Mamilodi police station between the hours of seven in the morning and say seven in the evening. You know, so the accused has leeway between seven in the morning and seven, seven in the, in the, in the evening. If he doesn't report within that, that, uh, that period, then he has violated the bail condition. He may be arrested. A condition may say that the accused, for example, has assaulted somebody in a particular area. They should not visit that area anymore. A condition may say that the accused, this is a very um, common condition that is fixed by the court. And uh, that the accused should not com communicate with witnesses. The court may, for example, give a condition that the accused should provide an address uh, where certain documents can be served on them if there is a need to do so. The payment of bail. Bail is paid by way of cash. Uh, Usually, bail may be cancelled if the accused fails to conform to the conditions as I've already in, in, intimated earlier. But you must mark the following. The fact that the accused has violated their bail conditions. Let me give you the example of, uh, uh, yo, which, which example? Let's say, uh, no, well, Mr. Tabo Bester was not on bail. But uh, if an accused, for example, uh, uh, fails to appear in court, that is a bail condition also. This is where the court says to the accused, you must come back to this court on this particular day. The accused does not come. The bail is usually cancelled, but the cancellation is done provisionally. The court will usually say, I cancel bail provisionally. Um, uh, until you give me an explanation on why you were not in court. But this is not what the court will say. They will simply say they'll issue a warrant uh, and hold it over for 14 days. Within the 14 days, the accused may appear in court and explain why they were not, uh, they were not in court. But let's say, for example, the accused simply disappeared, disappears and they are arrested. When the bail is cancelled, there must be a hearing for the cancellation of it, it's not done arbitrarily. The court must hold an inquiry to find out why the accused broke the conditions in the first place. So in the, the inquiry is in the form of a, a trial of sorts where the court will, uh, the accused will testify, I did not come to court on this. He might have good reasons for not coming to court. I've known instances, for example, where the accused did not come to court because they had been arrested on another case. So would it be fair to cancel and uh, estrip the bail to the state in such a case? No, it's not fair. Uh, we have a so-called free system of bail. Ne? It is not bound by the strict criminal procedure rules that we have. For example, the court's role during a bail application is inquisitorial in nature, meaning that the court uh, somehow descends into the arena and takes over the proceedings, asking questions and so on and so forth. Even though this happens in an ordinary adversarial setting, uh, it is more pronounced in the case of bail proceedings. Previous convictions are considered 
uh, in the case of uh, 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 a bail application, meaning that an accused person who appears before a court applying for bail is bound, is bound by the law to reveal to the court that they have previous convictions. Failure to do so uh, can expose them uh, to legal sanction. Now, as you already know, those of you who have already studied evidence, the court cannot know that an accused has got previous convictions when they appear before such a court, particularly in the case of a trial. Otherwise, they might be inclined to uh, prejudge uh, uh, the accused. If, if the accused appears be before a court on a charge of robbery, and the magistrate already knows that he was previously convicted of a theft or robbery, uh, 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 the, 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 the thinking, the reasoning is that if the court knows, we are now talking about in ordinary trials, the, 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 the reasoning is that if the court becomes aware uh, of those previous convictions, then uh, the court might be inclined uh, to prejudge uh, the merits. Now, in a bail application, the accused is mandated uh, by the law to, to, to expose or to mention that they have previous conviction. The record of the proceedings the record of the proceedings, it's very important. The record of the proceedings can be used in a subsequent trial. Uh, that is why in the case of bail, uh, uh, bail applications, most accused persons um, are very clever not to mention a lot about the merits of the case, although, although in some instances they may be compelled to do so. But they must be warned that in, uh, in case the matter goes to trial, aspects of the recording may be used in the subsequent trial. The evidentiary aspects of a, a bail application. In the case of a Schedule 5 offense, that is contained on page, uh, it's a very long discussion. I think it's on page, okay, it's on page 234 of your, of your prescribed textbook. It relates to uh, section 60, subsection 11, subsection A and B. Now, those of you who will be practicing as attorneys doing bail applications will deal a lot with Schedule 5 and Schedule 6 offense. Schedule 5 uh, relates to uh, certain offenses that are classified in uh, the Criminal Procedure Act or Schedule 5 of the Criminal Procedure Act. Now, once an accused is alleged to have committed such an offense, uh, remember, in each case, in each case, and this question was also posed to students in October, November, uh, the accused bears the onus of proof in the case of Schedule 5 and Schedule 6 offenses. Now, in the case of Schedule 5 offenses, uh, they are listed. You can go and look look at them in the Criminal Procedure Act, uh, which, has, which are your Schedule 5 offenses. The accused bears the own, owners of proof, and the accused must prove that the interests of justice warrant their release on bail. In the case of Schedule 6 offenses, the accused must prove to the court that exceptional circumstances exist, which in the interest of justice warrant their release on bail. Now, what are exceptional circumstances? Now, our magnus opus, our most important case, as far as uh, uh, bail applications are concerned, is State versus Damini. Uh, yeah, it's quoted throughout this chapter. Um, now, Justice Krichler said in that case, exceptional circumstances. There had been a lot of disagreement uh, in the courts uh, about what constitutes exceptional circumstances, with some courts or most courts saying that exceptional circumstances mean that the accused must prove uh, circumstances which are over and above the ordinary. Now, the court in Lamini 
said that exceptional circumstances are not necessarily that. Exceptional circumstances are unique to every individual. For example, A is arrested on a charge of uh, fraud. They defrauded their company of 2 million rents. B is arrested of the same thing. Now A comes to, to court and they say, look, uh, I understand you are charging me with this, but here are my exceptional circumstances. Yeah? Here, here are my exceptional circumstances. I'm sick. I have uh, cancer. And the type of treatment that I'm, uh, admini I'm, I'm, I'm administering at home, the state will not be able to, to do that. And I might die before I even come to trial. These are my exceptional circumstances. Yeah? Now, here's B, same circumstances. I have uh, AIDS. You are charging me with these charges, but I have AIDS. So uh, I will need my tra treatment out there. And then the magistrate says, but, or, or the state comes with evidence and says, yeah, but we have a very robust uh, um, um, HIV, a rollout in our prison. So you will you will get treatment. This is not an exceptional circumstances. So you are not going to get bail. It sounds very peculiar, but that is how it works. Ladies and gentlemen, before we move over to uh, the next chapter, uh, if you can just give me one minute just to take care of something here, yeah, then I'll come back. One minute. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, I'm back. Um, any questions on chapter 10? Dr. Gumwenda, are you seeing anything on the other side? No, no, Dr. Mkwena, there's nothing. No hands. Ah, okay. That means they okay. all understand. It seems so. It seems so. We have a clever bunch here. Okay. Uh, now we're going to move over to chapter, skip chapter 11. We are moving over to chapter 12. Chapter 12 essentially deals with uh, charge sheets and indictments. And this is what I am going to expect of you to know. A charge sheet uh, is a document. Uh, let me start with the indictment. An indictment is a document that is served on an accused who appears in the High Court. What the document essentially entails is it will contain the charge with which the accused is being charged, list of witnesses, and so on and so forth. Now, an indictment will ordinarily be served 
on the accused before they even appear in court. Now, a chat sheet is a completely, or let, let me say, not, not, let me not say completely, but a somewhat different animal in the sense that it is a document that is drawn up. Uh, the indictment uh, in similar fashion is drawn up by the prosecutor. But the charge sheet is a document that is used for the accused to appear in court uh, in, in the following sense. It is not served on the accused. No. The accused, when he appears in court, the prosecutor draws it up. This is the accused. It is a document that looks like this. The prosecutor draws it up. It contains the name of the accused, the charges with which he's charged, and so on and so forth. Now, going forward, this is the document on which the proceedings will be recorded uh, throughout. Every other appearance, uh, 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 pages will be appended on it on which uh, a record will develop. When a case is postponed, uh, the magistrate will indicate this is what was said, this is what went on, and then, and so on and so forth. That is the difference between the two. Now, here I say further particulars. What do I mean by further particulars? You will note on page, yeah, uh, chapter 12, page 255, but on page 256, uh, as I indicated to you, a very good guideline is to look at the constitutional provisions that inform each chapter. Now, you will notice that on page 256, uh, on the box there on top, uh, it refers to say, uh, the Constitution and this chapter, Section 32, access to information. Everyone has the right to access to information. Section 35, every person, every accused person has the right to a fair trial, which includes the right to be informed of the charge with sufficient detail to answer it. Now, what this essentially entails, uh, ladies and gentlemen, and you'll find the information on page 256 to 258. Now, um, before the case of State versus Chabalala, State versus Chabalala was decided, uh, I'm looking at the citation here, in 1995. It is one of the uh, seminal judgments of our constitutional court. Before 1994, um, uh, um, um, the accused did not have the right to access to information that was held by the state in, prepare, in preparing uh, for their case. Now, Section 35 has essentially entrenched that right. It reminds me of, a, of, a, of a, uh, an attorney uh, friend of mine. Uh, I once asked him, but how did you prepare in the past? Uh, without the benefit of a docket? And he says, you, you, have, you had to be very clever. Uh, and each time when a prosecutor and you have to have a you had to have a photographic memory and he says he would often when the he, he was he, you know he was very good friends with everybody at uh, prosecutors and so on and he says i would always uh, when chatting with the prosecutor um uh, zoom the in the topic of into the came up and i was not even Mr. aware Commander? at the time that, I, not aware the time that it was going to cause a Mr. Kumwanda, can you move, mute, please? Thank you. And, and uh, what he would do was that he would zoom in on the case docket. It was a, a peculiar skill that he had. And he says you, you had to uh, look at the docket uh, from a distance, uh, look at the statement, uh, look at the most salient parts of it so that you can be able to remember what is inside of the docket. Uh, that would assist you in knowing what the witnesses uh, were going to say. Now, fast forward to today, further particulars. Um, uh, every other accused appearing before a court preparing for a trial must know exactly the charges that they are going to face. To that extent, the Constitution says that um, um, uh, every accused person 
must be uh, uh, informed in sufficient detail, meaning that an accused is given copies of the docket. It doesn't end there. That is why I, I didn't say copies of the docket. I said further particulars. That's what they call them. Further particulars. You might give an attorney copies of the docket, but the docket might be very cryptic in the sense that there is information that is not contained in the docket, which um, uh, does not necessarily give the accused a clear indication of the charges that they are facing. So the accused may even petition the court. And I use the term petition very guardedly. It's not a petition in the sense of uh, a petition, if you know what I mean. But the the, the accused might ap uh, appeal to, not appeal, might apply to the court and say, look, I, I've been given uh, 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 copies of the case docket. I've gone through them, but I still do not understand certain things. And then they will have to write down particularly what they need. Clarify me on one, two, three. You're saying my client stole from a shop. Let's say, for example, the docket simply says he stole from a shop. Which shop is it? Identify. Is it ABC stores? Is it DEF stores? Things like that. Now, what you also need to know in terms of this chapter is the content of section 30, sorry, 84 of the Criminal Procedure Act. It relates to section 35.1 as well. Is this section 35.1? Sorry. No, section 35.3, sorry. Section 35.3. Now, the accused must be informed with sufficient detail. What does this mean? Um, when the charge sheet is drawn up, the particulars of the offense must be clearly set out. The accused must know exactly what charges they are facing. If the particulars are unknown, that must be clearly stated. Uh, um, uh, my friend, Mr. Kumwenda, can probably tell you uh, when when they prepare a a a charge of uh, of um, housebreaking, for example, if an accused is found having broken into a house, uh, let me put this to you, uh, Mr. Kumwenda, don't don't help them. Let me put this to you, an accused. You find a, a, a person inside your house. They've broken the door. They are inside of the house. Um, what are you going to charge them with? Remember, in the case of housebreaking, usually the, the charge that is put to the accused is housebreaking and theft because you found them in possession of certain items. Now, if you found the, uh, the accused inside the house and they haven't taken anything, Yet, what do you charge them with? Anyone, any takers? I don't see any hands, Mr. Kumwenda. Uh, oh, here's one. Mohau Tabang Market. Yes, Tabang, yes, Mohau Tabang. Uh, maybe um, malicious damage to property. Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, I think that that one can also fit in. Yeah. And, and trespassing. Uh, yeah, that's a good answer, Mohau. That's a good answer. Busisi Hi, sir. Yes. I think it's breaking and entering into a private place without permission. Do we have such a charge? I haven't looked at, I haven't brushed up on my <laughs> criminal procedure, but I don't remember such a charge. Do we have, do we have such a charge, uh, 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 Advocate Kumwenda? Uh, no, Dr. Mkwenda, we don't have such a charge. Yeah, no, I don't remember su su such a charge. Maybe in the U.S., I don't know. But as far as we are concerned, I don't remember such a charge. I may be mistaken, of course, but I don't. 
Are you prepared? We see where you can just put your hand down. Thank you. Are you prepared to help them? The accused yeah. has broken in, but they have not taken anything yet. Yeah, no, the accused can he can be charged there. Once he breaks uh -huh. in, then he, yes, he can be charged without breaking with an with an uh, with an intent unknown to the prosecution. Uh -huh. Yes. Thank you. That's Thank the you, answer uh, for you, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, the offense is unknown. He has already broken in. And I also take the, 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 the answer that was given by, by um, you, I forgot. Uh, the one who said uh, malicious damage to property. I think malicious damage to property in Tatekumenda, if I'm not mistaken, you will put it up as, a, as an alternative charge. Am I, am I correct? Yes, you are correct. It can be an alternative charge to the main count. Yeah, yes. you'll put that as an as an alternative charge. It's it's not necessarily in, but in, incorrect. But I wanted this part where you say, uh, uh, you the accused broke in. They are inside the house, but you don't know what they were trying to do. So it is an offense unknown to the to the prosecution. There is such a charge. So I'm I, I was just uh, explaining. That second uh, 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 ball there, particulars. If the particulars are known, then it must be clearly set out. In the case of a statutory offence, uh, the precise wording must be used. Uh, the wording will 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 be found in the legislation itself. It's if it, if a, if a, if an accused is charged with the um, 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 uh, what can it be? If you charge, we are charging them with murder, no, not, not murder. If you are, rape is now a statutory offense. What, what the prosecutor does when they, when they, when they prepare the, 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 the charge sheet, they go to the particular legislation and they, the, 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 the wedding must be precise. It must go hand in hand with what is in the, in the in the legislation itself, correction of errors in the charge in the charge sheet. Uh, this is doc, done. Doc, in, uh, Mwena. Yeah, Mwena. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Like, yes, like this Mwena. picture of you can give them like example of a of, of drugs. That uh, yes, yes. Section four, subsection yes, yes. B, possession of drugs yes. of the drug act. Yes. So it must be worded like that. It must be a section and must be specific yes. and of the drug act. Blah blah blah. Exactly, yes. exactly. Yes. You know what? I think I think we 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 didn't prepare better. We should actually have given you a, a, a much better example of a of, of of a piece of legislation that is used. But that the Gumwenda there is correct. What I need you to know, uh, 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 further on, in terms of this chapter. The correction of uh, of uh, of a charge. Ne? Section eighty eight. You will see in your textbook there is section eighty eight and section eighty six. Now section eighty eight refers to an instance where uh, a charge can be corrected by evidence. Now how is this done? This is where, um, for example, the the, the prosecutor has a uh, has uh, drawn up the charge sheet. They say that the offense was committed uh, on 16 June uh, 2020. Whereas the offense was actually committed on, on 25 August 2023. That is a mistake. But then throughout the evidence, when the evidence is given before the court, it becomes clear even to the court that every other witness who is testifying before this court is not referring to 16 June, they are referring to 25 August. So the, what, the, what, the, what the presiding officer will do, the presiding officer will say, yeah, but I see you have, prosecutor, you have, you have 16 June, 2020. But everybody keeps referring to 23, um, uh, 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 25 August, 2023. 
uh, what do you say? And the prosecutor will say, Aish, oops, like I say on my nose, oops, that's a mistake. Can I ask for the court? Uh, uh, no, 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 that's, that's a mistake there. It's, it's uh, in, in terms of section 88, the court will say, when it deliberates in the end, the, the mistake was cured by evidence. The prosecutor seemingly made a mistake. The court cannot say, yeah, but the prosecutor is saying 16 June 2020. So it means that the accused cannot, cannot be said to have committed the offense. Everybody is placing the accused at the scene of the offense on 25 August. But the charge sheet reads 20 June. So the, 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 the mistake committed by the prosecutor is cured by the evidence that is presented before the court. Now, in the same vein, using the same example that I've used earlier of, uh, of, uh, of the, 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 the defective chat sheet, the, 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 maybe it happens at the, at, the, at the beginning. The prosecutor has already read out the chat sheet. The witnesses are about to testify. Now, the prosecutor realizes, oops, um, I have a 20 June. I actually should have 20, 23, 25 August. And then the prosecutor stands up. Hey, um, your worship, your lordship, as they call them. I seem to have made a mistake. Can I please apply for an amendment of the charge sheet in respect of the date that I have there? Then the date will be duly amended. But remember, uh, throughout, the, 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 the presiding officer will ask the defense, um, do you feel comfortable if, if, we, if, we, uh, if we amend the date? The, uh, the, 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 the attorney will say, ah, no, I, I, I don't have a, any problem. But he, if he says no, he must have very good reasons for, 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 for saying so. The, 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 the standard requirement is that um, such a um, such an amendment cannot be done if it will be prejudicial to the accused. The splitting of offenses and the duplication of convictions. Now, this one, eh, ladies and gentlemen, we need to touch on it very briefly. Splitting of offenses and duplication of convictions. Courts do not usually duplicate convictions. Splitting of charges. What does the splitting of charges mean? If you look at the examples that are given in your, in, your, in your textbook, if you look at page 271, for example, now, they refer to a single act which constitutes more than a statutory offense or statutory and common law offenses. This is where a, a man is charged with incest in that they slept with their own 16-year-old child. In the same vein, they are charged with rape, ne? Uh, incest, a common law. Uh, rape is now a statutory offense, ne? rape. Uh, the third one is that they conducted sexual uh, uh, relations with a child below the age of 16. It's, it's the same act on the same person. Now, Ordinarily, when they speak of splitting of charges, a prosecutor has the prerogative to put any number of charges that they want. Shoot in the dark. It depends on what they can prove in court. And when I say a duplication of, 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 of convictions cannot occur, the magistrate cannot now come and say, you've committed incest, you've committed um, rape, you've committed sexual uh, intercourse with a, uh, with, a, with a woman under the age of 16. I'm going to convict you of all three. 15 years, 15 years, 15 years. No, it cannot be. In all this, the court will convict the accused of one of them. The court will convict them of one of them. This is where it comes in. I think that is the most Vivid example. The joinder of offenses. This is on page 275. 
I say in my notes, joinder of trials, that, that is a mistake. That is a mistake there. Joinder of uh, offenses or joinder of several accused. This is where in my example earlier, and I think it is also contained in your in your tutor, in your tutorial letter 103, assignment three, where we have a situation where the accused is arrested. Uh, three accused are involved in the commission of a crime. Uh, one of them is arrested much later. Uh, they can be added, but they, they can only be added before the plea proceedings. We are done with this chapter, ladies and gentlemen, unless you have a question. We are running out of time. I'm going to move over to to the next chapter, chapter the, uh, the trial courts, the venue of the courts. This we have already dealt with. Uh, in chapter two, uh, I'm not going to delve too deep into it. We, we have our lower courts, we have our higher courts. Um, and here we also deal with assessors. Very, very, very important for the exam, ladies and gentlemen. Mark it as very, very important. Assessors. You are probably going to have a question where we say to you, or we ask you, um, a magistrate uh, uh, is in the process of hearing a trial and he decides to call in a jury. A jury. Um, what is the feasibility, what is the workability of a jury trial in South Africa? Then you'll have to answer. I'm not going to tell you what the answer is. Um, uh, you'll have to determine whether we have a jury system in South Africa or we don't. Assessors. Assessors are used in the lower courts and in, 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 uh, in our divisions of the high court. Uh, you must be able to determine the circumstances under which um, um, assessors can be um, um, uh, recused. That is on page 281, where the assessor has personal interest and so on and so forth. Also, you must be able to determine the circumstances under which um, the assessor is able to adjudicate uh, during criminal proceedings. That is very, very, very important for the exam. This is what I'm going to be looking from you, looking for from you. The recusal of judicial officers, that is from 284. Judicial officers are required to be impartial and fair. Ne? The recusal of a judicial officer may be applied for under the following circumstances. Here is the test. It's set out on page 285 of your textbook. There must be a suspicion that the judicial officer might be, not would be, might be biased. The suspicion must be that the, a, reason, a reasonable person in the, in the position of the accused would view uh, the judicial officer as such. The suspicion must be based on reasonable grounds. The suspicion must be one which re, a reasonable person, person referred to would or might have held. Please remember, we will not ask you in the exam a question in which we say, mention the circumstances under, under which a recusal can take place. No, 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 no. You are never getting that. But you must understand the concept of judicial fairness, uh, uh, judicial bias. Uh, we did have a question in, in October, November on judicial bias. Remember, our questions even direct you 
to the textbook where you find the answer. So uh, suffice it to point out, you need to know and understand the circumstances under which uh, a judicial officer may be required to recuse themselves without necessarily, without necessarily knowing that table that is there. There must be suspicion to this, there must be. What might actually happen in the exam is that we might ask you to deliberate on these aspects in relation to the facts that we might that that we might have given you in the exam. We are not going to ask you to tabulate them. Uh, usually, if we say tabulate them, then you tabulate, tabulate them in relation to the facts that we give you. If you tabulate them and you simply copy out what is in the textbook, zero you get, zero you get. Uh, trial by jury, I've already referred to it. Impartiality and fairness. Um, this was uh, um, uh, um, held in Mabuza. Uh, the case of State versus Mabuza is a 1991 case. Uh, it's on page 289. You must be able to say uh, what are the circumstances under which um, um, uh, it can be said that the court was in, uh, partial and unfair. The court should not conduct its questioning in such a manner that it is, it, its impartiality may be questioned or doubted. The court should not take part in the case to such an extent that its vision is clouded by the dust of the arena and is then unable to adjudicate properly. Even with this one, even with this one, if we ask you a question, we will not ask you to tabulate this. What would be the point of us telling you to go to the textbook and merely tabulate this and then give you marks? It would not make sense. Impartiality and, and, and fairness. We had this in the exam. Know it. The magistrate, the judicial officer must be impartial and courteous. Uh, and it, uh, here, in the textbook, page 289, we give you instances of what could be considered um, um, capious or discapious. The oldi alteram, alteram partem rule, we had this in May, June in the exam, where we gave students a scenario and, and wanted them to give us uh, an exposition of whether they thought in the circumstances that we gave uh, whether the the the, uh, uh, the rule of odi alteram per tem can be said to have been um, uh, observed in the circumstances. Decisions are, are are made solely on evidence and on the oath and under oath. Sorry. What does this mean? It's on page two hundred and ninety of your textbook. Um, every witness who testifies in terms of section 164 of the Criminal Procedure Act, every witness who, who testifies before a court must testify under oath. If they do not testify under oath, then they testify under, what is it by the way? Dr. Mkwena. Information. Dr. Mugwena. Yes, yes, yeah. Dr. Mugwena. Agragram, they can testify under oath or they can solemnly declare, like, like, like the Muslims. Yeah. They, they, Thank they you. Thank you, Dr. Mugwena. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah, under oath or, or, or uh, yeah, you see, uh, Dr. Mugwena has just simplified it for me. Uh, I, was, I was looking for the word affirmation. But okay. now, did you hear what the Ndadegu Mwenda said? They solemnly swear. They go into the witness box and say, I solemnly, solemnly swear. They, they don't go the oath with the oath. I swear that the evidence I'm going to give will be the truth and nothing but the truth. So help me God. But some people do not want to, 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 to take that oath. Uh, some because they are atheists. Some because they, are, they feel that uh, it is not correct according some of them are christians but they do not believe in swearing uh, in the manner in which it is uh, it is uh, 
mandated by our courts. Uh, so they will solemnly swear. Um, yeah, that you need to know. And also, decisions solely upon yeah. evidence. What does this mean? And Dr. Do, do Mukwena. Dr. Yeah, and yeah. also the, for, for, for the children, because the children, they don't take an oath. That the children are being warned to speak the truth, but that when they are warned by a court to speak the truth, is equivalent to have taken an oath. Ah, exactly, exactly. Thank you, Dr. Yeah, yeah thank, thank you, Dr. Yeah, yeah, I had forgotten that one. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You, you, you might have wanted to know what if it's a child who does not understand what an oath entails or what, what, what an affirmation means to sell solemnly swear. So basically, uh, what Ndate Kumwenda has just uh, alluded to, the court will simply say to the child, uh, that is the warning that uh, that advocate Kumwenda is referring to. Um, um, do you know what is what is the truth? I mean, you are asking a, a, a six-year-old, for example, and who is a, who is a star witness in the case. Um, uh, do you know what it means to tell the truth? Uh, the child will say, "I don't know what it means to tell the truth." Uh, the test that they use, the voir dire that they use, the magistrate will say. Look at that. Um, um, uh, maybe they'll show them an object uh, inside the courtroom. Um, uh, maybe a file, a blue file. And they will say to them, can you see that file? And the child will say, yeah, I can see it. Um, what color is it? The child will say it's blue. And um, if anybody comes and says that the, the file is red, for example, Will they be telling the truth? The child will say no. They will be telling a lie. Ne? Now, having passed that threshold, the presiding officer already knows that the child knows between right and wrong, or presumably they know the difference between right and wrong. So going further, uh, they may ask them one or two more similar questions to establish whether they understand the essence of the concept of telling the truth and lies. And based on that, if they are satisfied that the, 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 the child can uh, differenti differentiate uh, between these concepts, then the child uh, is duly sewn in. As a, as, a, as a witness, but as, 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 as Advocate Kumwenda has, uh, has, has intimated, the magistrate will say, I'm, we are, you are now going to talk, you are going to give evidence. I want you to only tell the truth. Now the child already understands, I want you to only tell the truth, no lies, only the truth. That is how the, the children are shown in. But the point that I wanted to come in uh, before, um, 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 uh, Advocate Kumwenda set me right on this one. Decisions are made solely on evidence. Now, what does this mean? When a, uh, when a presiding officer decides on a on a, on the on the on um, after hearing evidence, ne? evidence is under oath, and evidence. Um, uh, or, or, and the, the evidence that is um, on which a, a judgment is made is evidence that was uh, delivered under oath. Ne? Um, decisions that are made, that is now your judgment. Your judgment is made solely under such evidence. For example, a presiding officer is sitting in court. Ne? Uh, the evidence before this court is that uh, uh, Mr. Tabo Bester, let me use the, 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 the example of Mr. Tabo Bester. Mr. Tabo Bester uh, was assisted by uh, 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 A to escape. Ne? This A, remember, um, uh, uh, presiding officers do not live in a, in a different planet. They live in this world. They watch TV like everybody else. They listen to the news. Now, the presiding officer hears this evidence uh, that you know uh, Mr. Tabo Bester escaped and he was assisted by A. Now, 
A does not appear in court, does not give evidence. But there is evidence before this court. They keep mentioning him, mentioning him. Yeah, he's the main guy who assisted him. Ne? Subsequently, the magistrate decides, I want to call this witness in terms of section 186 of the Criminal Procedure Act. I want to call this witness because he seems to know much about what happened. The witness does not pitch. But now the magistrate decides in judgment, he makes a ruling. He says, you know, uh, throughout this uh, proceedings, A was being mentioned and A was never, never came to court to testify. But I'm, I'm coming to the conclusion that he is the one who assisted Mr. Bester to escape. Such evidence cannot go in. You cannot, you cannot. It is only evidence that, that is presented before court that is required to form part of the judgment. Uh, yeah. I'm moving over to the next chapter, ladies and gentlemen, arraignment of the accused. Hey. Let's see. Arraignment of the accused gentlemen refers quite simply to let's see. Uh, it, refer, it refers to the, 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 the plea proceedings. There are instances, for example, where when, a, uh, when plea proceedings meet dispensed with. Uh, you will see in my notes there that I say uh, a plea may be dispensed with. Um, in my notes, I say it's on page 300, 300 to 301. Uh, whether, whether there is ambiguity in the plea and so on and so forth. Now, when, when we say that a plea is dispensed with, we mean that a plea, the magistrate simply does away with the plea, but essentially that is not what it means because you cannot dispense with the plea because the plea is, uh, forms uh, the very essence of what the accused testifies to or what the proceedings are all about. If the accused says, uh, uh, if the accused declines to plead, that is why uh, 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 the legislature so fit, our courts so fit uh, to intimate that in instances, for example, where the accused is uncooperative, then you have to have certain rules as, uh, that you that you that you uh, that you implement, which will ensure that the proceedings go further. Can you imagine, for example, in a situation where the accused says, I'm not going to plead, and the rule says if he doesn't plead, then the case does not proceed, uh, then we, we, we would forever be stuck. Now, what, 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 what um, the legislature decided to do, particularly in terms of Section 113, remember our pleas are done in terms of section 112, 113, 114, 115. Now, where there is ambiguity, for example, where, where the accused refuses to plead, a plea of not guilty is registered, the trial proceeds. Where it is not clear what the accused is pleading to, the trial proceeds anyway. Uh, he said, he, the court, Ask the accused, what do you plead? No, you see your worship, and it, it's very clear that the accused is sound of mind, but it keeps telling stories. No, you know, your worship, I was not in Cairo, I was in this, that, and the other. The magistrate registered the plea of not guilty, the trial proceeds. Or the accused is obstructive, makes noise, and says, no, I don't recognize this court, and what not. Not guilty. Mentally disabled person, a different procedure, uh, takes place. 
I'm asking you to read through that procedure. I will not necessarily examine you on, but this is what you need to know. Uh, the types of plea. Um, accused may plea guilty. The accused may plea not guilty. The accused may plea may plead uh, that they were previously convicted of the same offense. The accused may plead that they were previously acquitted of the same offense, that they've received a presidential pardon, that the court does not have jurisdiction, the prosecutor lacks uh, a title, uh, that they, there is an order before the court in the section 342, capital A, that uh, the matter cannot proceed before this court, uh, that the accused was discharged in terms of, has been discharged in terms of section um, 204 of the Criminal Procedure Act. Now, you will notice that this is a very long chapter, but I will endeavor at any rate to explain a few of these aspects uh, that you need to know. You need to know the different pleas. Ne? You notice there on my on my diagram that we have about is it nine or eight pleas? It's nine usually. Yeah. Uh, let me explain the following: where the accused, for example, says they have been discharged. Uh, the, the rest you can you can you can you can study on your own. They have been discharged in terms of section two hundred four. I think this is probably uh, a, a bit more dicey. Section 204, this is where an accused, uh, let's, let, let's take the case of uh, Tabo Bester. Ne? One of the people who helped him escape uh, approaches or is approached by the state because they know a lot more. And they say to them, look, um, if you can tell us more about how the escape took place, because there isn't anybody else who's willing to tell us, we will make you what we call a 204 witness. We will not pursue the charges against you, but you have to give us the whole story. The witness testifies, uh, and you know, he, he even testifies to the effect that the head of the prison was involved and so on and so forth. Now, what happens at the end of their testimony, the court, no, 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 not at the end of their testimony. At the end of the trial, the court will make a determination whether or not they were truthful in delivering their evidence. And they will make a recommendation to uh, the prosecution whether to charge this person or not. If the court, for example, finds that they were truthful and they actually helped in pinning down uh, Tabo Bester and his other cohorts, then the court will make a recommendation. Now, if the accused is subsequently charged, uh, and it does sometimes happen, the accused is charged of the same offense, he'll simply say, yeah, but go to the record. The record says that I was discharged in terms of section 204. Ne? Now, an order in terms of, order of court in terms of section 342, capital A, subsection two. Now, uh, here I'm going to give you the example of the case of State versus Zuma and Talis. If you remember well, that case was in our courts for many years, for over a decade, almost 20 years. In some instances, the case was withdrawn. Ne? Now it happens on a daily basis that a case comes to court, the state withdraws, and they subsequently they summons the accused again. They withdraw, they summons. It happens almost every day. You won't believe this, but it does. Now, the accused can at some point say, tell the court, look, the state is playing dice with my, with my life. They keep bringing me to court. They don't have evidence. They don't have this. They don't have that. Now, I asked the court to make an order in terms of section 342, capital A, subsection 2 of the Criminal Procedure Act. What, the, what does the... Um, uh, the provision entail. It entails that if the case is going to be brought before court subsequently, it can only be done so with the instruction of the DPP. The DPP will look at the, will have to look at the docket and say, 
I feel this case must be taken to court because we have sufficient evidence, we have our witnesses, then the case can go to court to be heard. Now, the accused, if they are brought to court, and the, 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 uh, the prosecution wants to charge them, they can simply say, but if you look at the record, this is just a waste of time because the, the, the docket has not even been through, through to the DPP. So why are you bringing this to court? Ne? And another one, uh, pr prosecutor title, this is where, this is Mr. Zuma's case against uh, Billy Downer. It was shot off, as you already know. Uh, Dr. Says saying that the prosecutor is not title. Lack of jurisdiction. Yes, Mr. Kumanda. Uh, yeah, yeah, to, to interrupt you, that uh, section 342, capital A, it yeah. can be used by the accused person. It can also be used by the prosecution. Like you find that always when the accused have to, to go on trial, they come with excuses, appointing another attorney. When they say matter for trial, accused is sick, just delaying tactics. So the prosecution oh, can yeah. also bring that application for unreasonable delay on the part of the accused. Oh, yeah. Yeah, okay. yeah. Thank, thank you, thank you, in the thank, you thank, thank you, Dr. Mkwena. Thank you. Yeah, yeah. That is another instance in which uh, 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 Section three four two capital A uh, can can be used. But now here we are talking about it in the context of your of your plea. But that is a thank you so much. Thank you so much for that one. Uh, and then I think the rest you can figure out. What you also need to know for the purposes of the exam plea bargaining. Plea bargaining. We've had this in the exam previously, in two previous exams. We'll probably have it in the current exam as well. Traditional plea bargaining. You need to distinguish the plea. We have traditional plea bargaining. Traditional plea bargaining has always been there. It has been part of our um, 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 uh, procedural architecture for, for, for decades. Ne? What are the, the essentials of traditional plea bargaining? Now, it is an informal agreement between the state and the defense. What happens here? This is where the state, or rather, um, uh, it, it, can, it can apply either way. The state can approach the defense or the, the defense can approach the state um, and say, look, um, the, the, uh, usually it would be the defense saying, look, you are charging me with uh, 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 50 charges of fraud, ne? but I can clearly see here that you, you, you'll you probably be only be able to prove 25. Why don't I plead guilty to the 25? Uh, and then, you know, we'll see where the, 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 uh, the whole thing goes, how the court decides. It's an informal agreement. Ne? Um, It happens in the following ways, the forms in which it happens. The one that I, re I refer to is the one in the middle where the accused says, I'll plead to fewer charges. Ne? And then the one where the accused says, I'll plead to a lesser charge. You are charging me with murder. But if you look very closely, I think here we have culpable homicide because I was actually negligent in killing the deceased. Can you take a, a plea of um, a culpable homicide, rather, or a plea of assault with intent to do grievous bodily harm. So the, 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 the accused may say, look, instead of charging me with, uh, yeah, let, let's take Zuma and Talis, ne? Um, uh, either of the parties, either Zuma or Talis, they come and say, look, um, uh, you see Talis, let's say Mr. Zuma goes and says, ah, you see Talis, I'm not a corrupt man, but these people were out to corrupt me. They were the ones who actually instigated this whole thing. And I can tell you even more. Remember, ladies and gentlemen, I'm giving you just an example. And, and then Mr. Zuma goes and says, he spills the beans on them. And he says, you, you know, they actually gave more to, 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 to other people than to me. They gave to this one, to this one. And oh, a Pandora's box opens. Ne? Now, charge me with one charge. I will plead guilty. I'll, I'll plead guilty or if you say one or five charges, but I'll give you this information. But the essence of it, the most important thing, the court is not bound to the agreement. 
the accused pleads guilty in all the forms that I've given you here. The accused pleads guilty. Uh, the matter is put before the court. The court decides at the end of the day uh, the sentence against the accused. Now, this is the direct opposite of statutory plea bargaining in terms of Section 105, Capital A. Now, this is a formal agreement. It is drawn up. It is written down uh, between the defense and the state. Um, they even agree on sentence. They even write it down. The accused says, look, I'll plead guilty to 25 charges. Uh, and let's agree that you'll, uh, you'll ask, the court will give me a sentence of uh, seven years imprisonment, which is wholly suspended for five years, something like that. The court is bound by that agreement. The court cannot, cannot say no uh, to that agreement, but I'll give you, I'll give you, um, 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 a, 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 another proviso to it. Even though the court is, if the court agrees to it, then it is bound. But the court may refuse to honor the agreement. The court may look at it and say, yeah, but I'm looking at this thing. If you look at it very clearly, I, I think I do not agree with the sentence that you are giving uh, the, the accused. It's too lenient. But then if the court says so, then the, 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 uh, both the, the defense and the accused are free to take it to a different court. Or they may say, yeah, well, uh, what do you recommend, for example? And the magistrate would say, yeah, well, instead of a wholly suspended sentence, why don't you weigh in um, a fine of two, or two million or something like that? Or why don't you throw in a condition that the accused should pay back uh, some of the money that they stole or something to that effect. And if they all agree, then they go back, they redraw the, the plea agreement and it becomes formal and the accused pleads. Uh, yeah, that is what I wanted you to, yeah. That is essentially, ladies and gentlemen, what, what I expect of you in this chapter. The rest of the stuff you can, you, you must read, you must read for a much better understanding of, uh, of, uh, and of, of the whole contextual edifice of, of chapter uh, 14. Now, I think we have run out of time, but I will at any rate uh, uh, go back to um, the questions that I gave you to go through. I'm looking for my, ah, here they are. Let's do this very, very, very quickly. Uh, according to the discussion, I have just a few minutes before we finish. Um, if you look at uh, the questions which I've uh, sent through to you, uh, question one says, why is allegedly killed in a fight with uh, Z over a long-standing feud? During the investigation of the crime, Sergeant A receives information from B, who was apparently present during the killing, but is not willing to provide formal, a formal statement, nor test, testify in a subsequent trial, simply because he's not interested and there is nothing that a can do in the matter because he knows his rights b that is now the uh, uh the, the investigating officer believes that as a functionary of the state he has the power to investigate crime in terms of section 205 of the constitution and that b has a duty to provide him with the information he requires to solve the alleged crime. Briefly discuss the legal powers and duties of A and B and the limitations, if any, there too. Very quickly, who, who has the answer to that one?
Can you see anyone that the woman? Uh, there, there, there's no hand that is up at uh, the Mkwena, Dr. Mkwena. Okay. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, this is something that we dealt with today. Um, in the interest of time, I will direct you uh, to the answer. The answer is on page 183 uh, of the prescribed textbook, paragraph 1.2. Uh, this is where we dealt with the instance where uh, a witness refuses to testify. Uh, um, uh, uh, we were giving you five five marks there. Look at uh, uh, page 183, paragraph 1.2. Uh, essentially, uh, the, 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 the prosecutor can approach the court uh, to have the accused summoned uh, to provide evidence or, or, or to explain why they do not want to give evidence. Uh, the provisions of section 189 will come into effect. Uh, 189 of the Criminal Procedure Act. Remember, we are dealing with section 205 of the Criminal Procedure Act, not 205 of the Constitution. Now, question two. During a robbery at the um, Nandi Tavern, the owner of the establishment, C, who owns a licensed firearm, shoots at one of the assailants as they make away with the loot, injuring one of them on the leg. B is subsequently arrested at a local hospital by Sergeant B upon information, whilst trying to have the projectile removed from his leg. So uh, uh, C is trying to remove uh, the projectile. Uh, we had this in our May, June exam last year. A refuses to have his fingerprints taken on the basis that the taking of his fingerprints will essentially criminalize an innocent person as he had nothing to do with the alleged offense. Uh, it will violate his rights of privacy and dignity will violate his uh, physical integrity. Briefly discuss with reference to state versus Uma, uh, whether the issues raised by A are indeed valid and constitutional. Uh, the answer is to be found on page 187. Now, what we wanted the students to do in respect of this question, look at the, at the questions that are set out in Roman figures one, two, three, four, and five. Now in the exam, as I recall, we actually allocated more marks. No, here I didn't allocate marks, but we allocated, if I recall correctly, we allocated eight, if not 10 marks. Now, A refuses to have his fingerprints taken on the basis that the taking of fingerprints will essentially criminalize an innocent person. Now. When you answer the question, you, uh, students were required to say whether the taking of the fingerprint in relation to the information in the textbook on pages 186 to 187 would essentially criminalize them. Now, state versus Huma, you will see uh, from number one to number five, this is where the student was supposed to find their answer. Would you say, under the circumstances, that uh, uh, the taking of fingerprints, as decided in state versus Uma, would criminalize the accused? Anyone? Mm -hmm. what we what we actually the, the answer to this one would be number number four the fingerprints the student was able to say this the, uh, a would essentially not be criminal criminalized this is the most uh, acceptable way of taking down 
uh, evidence. And in essence, uh, the fingerprints are eventually destroyed, meaning that you are not criminalized in any way. Roman figure two violate his rights to privacy and dignity. If you look at number two, in practice, fingerprints are taken in private and not in the courtroom or in a public place. So his rights to dignity and privacy would not have been violated. This is what the student was supposed to say. Ne? Roman figure three, the taking of fingerprints would violate his uh, physical integrity. It would be number three. The process of obtaining fingerprints does not, in essence, constitute an intrusion into, an, uh, an, uh, into a person's physical integrity because it is not accompanied by physical pain of any kind. You see, this is what, how we expect you to answer questions in the exam. Now, Roman figure four. In terms of state versus Roma, is it constitutional, the taking down of fingerprints? you get your easy marks. Obviously the case decide, the court decided it is not, uh, it, is, it, it, is, it is constitutional to do so, to take uh, fingerprints from an accused. Briefly discuss the eligibility of Sergeant B to remove the projectile from A. Uh, we've already discussed that one. Uh, look at page, um, page 186, look at page 186. Um, uh, only, only a qualified medical practitioner can, uh, uh, can remove uh, the projectile from um, uh, um, from a person. Number four, Sergeant A receives information from an informant that X is selling different drugs from his house, including cocaine, nyaope, and heroin. A is a diligent and conscientious police officer who likes to do things by the book. To this extent, she feels that the best course of action in this regard is to obtain a search warrant to conduct a, a search of X's house to find the incriminating evidence. A is nonetheless apprehensive about the fact that X might be alerted to the prospective search by corrupt, corrupt police officials in her own precinct whilst awaiting the authorization. Briefly explain, that is now A, the legal options available to A in this regard, especially in light of the nature, portability, and disposability of the substances. What would your answer be to that? Your answer would be found on page 197 and it relates to um, paragraph 5.2. Uh, a search in terms of section 22A of the Criminal Procedure Act. Now, you will notice that uh, section 22A and section 25.3 refer to the same. This is where uh, the, 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 the person conducting uh, uh, the search uh, realizes that if they, if they hesitate, uh, the, the items which are, they are looking for might be disposed of. A search warrant will be issued in light of the items that are allegedly on the, on the, on the premises. Had they gone to a judge, had they gone to a magistrate, a warrant would have been issued. Issued. So 
they feel that because of the urgency and uh, the delay will mean that uh, the search will no longer become necessary. So your answer is on page 197, paragraph 5.2.2. Number B, 4B, would the position have been different or similar in the instance where X was the owner of the dwelling from which B operated? Briefly discuss. Would the position have been different? Your answer is to be found on page 201. Page 201, paragraph 5.3, 5, the powers of occupiers of premises. Would the position have been different or similar in the instance where X was the owner or was the owner of the dwelling from which B uh, operated? B is not the owner of the premises. Um, um, uh, so X is the owner of the premises. Would the position have been different? In terms of section 24 of the Criminal Procedure Act, any person who is lawfully in charge or, or occupation of any premises and who reasonably suspects that stolen produce, blah, 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 or any article placed under the custody, possession of any person, intoxicating liquor, can you see that, section 24? So if you look at subsection two, section 24, subsection two, uh, A, sorry, X would have been able to give permission for the search. Question number five. B is arrested at a shop, at shop value mark supermarket for shoplifting in that she stole a bar of chocolate. Back at the police station, she is handed over to Sergeant A for processing. 5A, briefly discuss whether A is empowered to release B on bail and the circumstances, if any, under which A can release be on bail. Uh, we've already discussed this. The answer would be found on page 213, paragraph 2.3, uh, particularly the limitations. Briefly discuss whether A is empowered to release B and the circumstances under which A can release B on bail. Uh, she was arrested. Uh, for stealing a bar of chocolate. Does this fall under uh, the auspices uh, of offenses under which police bail can be granted? Um, I believe it does. Um, and then on 2.3, uh, you, you, you would have been expected to discuss uh, uh, the circumstances, uh, like discretionary special conditions, uh, whether the police are able to grant these, and so on and so forth. But your answer is on page 213, paragraph 2.3. 5B, during a bail application involving B, the prosecutor D introduces to the court the fact that B has a previous conviction of theft. Briefly discuss the admissibility of such evidence in the bail application. So basically here, you were requested to explain whether in the course of this bail application, um, um, previous conviction are previous convictions are, are admissible or not. Uh, we had this in the May, no, October, November exam. So you would have been expected to discuss whether uh, when looking at the circumstances, um, 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 uh, that is the circumstances being, being a bail application, whether um, 
a sorry um the accused can be released no not the accused can be released bail applications are applicable my mind is tired ladies and gentlemen so you you would have found your answer on page 231 paragraph 9.3 proof of previous convictions uh, in bail applications uh, um, um, previous convictions must be proved. The last one, number six, during B's subsequent trial, the charge sheet simply reads as follows. B is charged with the offense of theft of for stealing a bar of chocolate. Briefly discuss whether the charge sheet complies with the requirements of section 84.1 of the Criminal Procedure Act. Your answer would have been found on page 260 uh, to 261. Um, section 84, if you look at it very closely, we, we have this in, in the May-June exam. Um, um, uh, if you look further on, on page 261, in the exam, uh, the hints were very elaborate. We wanted you uh, to in line with the particulars that are contained on page 261, namely the name of the offense for which the accused uh, is, uh, is charged. Uh, in line with the items that we had there, you had to look at the charge that we gave you in the question and say, does this conform with what section 84 wants? Section 84, if you look on page 260, Verbatim, it explains what is required. Now, on page 261, uh, we have tried to somehow simplify the aspects as to what is required in order for us to be able to say that the charge sheet uh, complies to the requirements. We had this in the exam, the May-June exam, and it carried 10 marks. But you must be able to say, looking at the charge sheet, Looking at the provisions of section 84, subsection 1, this charge sheet uh, essentially conforms to the requirements of section uh, 84.1, sorry, 84, subsection 1. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, we've come to the end of uh, this session. What I'm going to do, like with the previous uh, um, uh, session, um, I'm going to post uh, this time around, I will only post uh, the page numbers on which you will be able to find the answers to the questions that I've uh, that I posted before this session, and then we'll take it from there. If you don't have any further questions, uh, I'm going to close the session uh, with uh, the um, um, with the the proviso as well that you are you are you are you are more than welcome to contact me if there is any aspect of the session with any of the chapters that you do not understand um we will be having another session uh, i think we'll have two more sessions including one uh, where we'll basically be discussing with we will be discussing the exam um um, um how to approach the exam and so on and so forth. Uh, are there any further questions? If not, I'm going to uh, declare the class uh, closed, ladies and gentlemen. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you for for attending. I think I see I've overrun by by an hour, uh, but as I've already indicated, ladies and gentlemen, I we remain uh, available to assist. If there's anything that you need to ask, send us an email, phone us. Uh, we are always available and ready to assist. Um, have a nice day, further. Thank you. Thanks, Dr. Mukwena. Thank you.